Hi, I'm Leo Hickman and I'm the editor of Carbon Brief. I recently got the chance to spend an hour in conversation with Adam McKay. Adam is the Academy Award winning screenwriter and director behind hit movies such as Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, The Big Short, Vice and Don't Look Up. His producer credits include Daddy's Home and the universally acclaimed TV series Succession. In 2023, McKay established Yellow Dot Studios, which describes itself as a non-profit production studio to raise awareness and mobilize action on the climate emergency. Our conversation ranged over a variety of climate-related topics, including what Adam describes as the Great Silence. But we also moved on to chat about James Lovelock, Elon Musk, Kamala Harris versus Donald Trump, and his love of the 1957 classic movie, The Bridge on the River Kwai. I began by asking Adam why it seems that so many of the world's greatest storytellers seem to be avoiding the topic of climate change in their work. Yeah, well, I've referred to this time before and I've read other people have called this time of inaction uh, and like almost no popular discourse about uh, climate change, rapid climate change as the great silence. Um, Lately, I've been calling not just climate change, but a host of the issues we need to be, or, or catastrophes we need to be dealing with as the great pretend, uh, the way we all kind of pretend they're not happening. Um, why aren't filmmakers, novelists, TV shows, let's even throw the news in there, addressing what is, I would say the greatest threat i you really have to think about it but the greatest threat in human history right Mm -hmm. i mean if you look at it the entire foundation of the civilization we live in is the climate stability of the holocene era and we have now left the holocene (laughs) we are uh, approaching the Pleistocene era, the time of woolly mammoths and giant sloths. And if we don't get our act together soon, we'll go to the Miocene, which for anyone who doesn't know that, they should look it up because it is not a place we want to be. And how can it be that so many people are quiet about this I think it it relates to the reality that our culture is much more connected to our economy uh, than we ever think it is. I think they are one and the same. I think culture is a byproduct of economy and self-interest and once you take in the enormity of you know rapid climate warming it shatters so many of the foundations of our identity of our community uh, of civilization of our achievements our successes our failures everything changes instantly And I also think uh, because of that risk, when you really look at the reality of what we're confronting, there's also a very high risk, and I've experienced it personally, of other people with that, uh, that investment, with that identity mocking you because it's such a preposterously large dynamic that we're dealing with problem that we're dealing with when you really say it in even like hard scientific terms it sounds like you're a crazy person (laughs) so i think the combination of the collective agreement necessary 
to drive our economy, which is more and more become a consumer economy, uh, the, the sense of identity and community and culture necessary to keep that economy afloat mixed with uh, the threat of mockery has silenced a lot of big voices. The, yeah, that's, that's, it's really interesting that you, you, you've already talked, you've already sort of spoken to some of the other formats and forms and shapes in culture, you know, also popular entertainment, you know, the obviously movies and comedy kind of your area and TV, but also pop music and theater and even literature to some extent, they've all seemingly struggled to some, some way, shape or form to deal with the topic of climate change. Or, but, but maybe you feel there's actually some exceptions to that. Maybe you feel there's some, you know, sort of, sort of shining lights in, a, in amid that kind of gloom and that kind of avoidance and that silence. No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, there are a few. Uh, Mark Ruffalo, the actor, really understands what we're up against. God bless him. Billy Eilish, the singer, has a, 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 a pretty acute awareness of what's going on. The, the all-time legend, Brian Eno, understands what we're up against. So there are those people. I also think, I mean, this is something I think about probably far too much, is how can a culture shut these realities out? and the connection between culture, economy, power, the sense of well-being uh, that we all have around our fossil fuel Holocene identity and sense of our life, our, our career. And at what point does that shift? Does the reality around us become so tactile does it shift and there's another thing that's just much simpler that we bump into all the time with our uh, non-for-profit climate studio yellow dot which is you know we have to raise money from very wealthy people and when you have that much money and we're talking about like billionaires uh, but honestly even people worth you know hundreds of millions or millions. It, I think we don't fully appreciate how much that money makes life pleasant and, and, and sort of shock free. So a lot of these people really don't wanna talk about the nitty gritty reality of, of the waters we're sailing into simply because it makes their day unpleasant <laughs> the movie i always refer to is bridge on the river Kwai. Mm -hmm. um it's really a remarkable film there's, there's very I, i've never seen a movie like it in that it's a world war ii action prisoner of war camp film that is actually about a culture being applied in the wrong time and place. And in this case, it's Victorian England, stiff upper lip, what what uh, sort of approach uh, being applied to building a bridge for the Japanese right in the middle of a world war. And the realization that, that applying that culture to that situation is is sheer madness. But it, it it's it's, there aren't many movies that are made uh, about warped culture, culture misapplied, toxic cultures. I mean, probably the most you see the run up to uh, Nazi Germany, you'll see plenty of things about that. But I, I really think it's the key to kind of where we are is, you know, that the much like a star with a gravitational pull, trillions and trillions of dollars affect the way people see and engage with the world. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, obviously, you know, you, you're well known for your work on, you know, on climate themes, either directly or kind of indirectly. And there's been reports, Hollywood rumors, gossip, whatever. I don't you can correct us on this, but around that you're working on a sort of movie called Greenhouse. Um, I have no idea if that's right or not. And also that you have the rights to David Wallace Wells's 2019 book, The Inha Uninhabitable Earth. Are you in a position to sort of say more about these projects? Because that, that sounds really interesting. For sure uh, that those rumors are correct. <laughs> uh, inspired by David Wallace Wells's Uninhabitable Earth, uh, I wrote this script, which was initially called To See. Now we're calling it Greenhouse, although that could change. And uh, it, it gets into a lot of what we're talking about with storytelling, culture, uh, holding on to, you know, an old economy, holding on to old routines. And it, and it takes place over a, a large time span. Um, we have it, we have it mostly cast, but we still have a couple of key roles we need to fill. And it's not set up at any studio right now. Um, so it, it's, and I'm actually doing a rewrite. But yes, that is correct. We are proceeding with that movie and fingers crossed we can get some financing and get it made and hopefully give it a, a big distribution. Okay, that, yeah, that sounds exciting. Um... The, the, you've already touched on us a little bit, but the failure of mainstream media and kind of journalism to some extent is a strong theme for your work. And it's hard to think of an area where this failure is as acute as as climate change. I mean, with the, you know, the business model of journalism and media is kind of with its perverse incentives and biases is effectively this business model is kind of totally shot, really, when it comes to informing the public. In, even Carbon Brief itself was pretty much launched in 2010 as a specific response to this problem about the business model failure. You know, what what is our way out of this, in your view? Is this unsolvable? This problem with with the media and journalism at the moment in terms of forming the public, or is there a route out of this? Do you think yeah, the the media, the news media, is particularly infuriating only because they're declared job is to inform the public about uh, events and stories that will affect all of our lives and we need to be informed about so we can properly vote and we can affect uh, you know our supposed representatives in government and I'm, I'm almost to the point where I, I don't complain about it much anymore because it's so utterly broken and and really the large majority of people certainly here in the states are aware that the news is pretty much not the news you know their rating rating subscriptions are plummeting uh i just read somewhere that when uh, after joe biden became president the washington post uh, hemorrhaged uh, half a million subscribers. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, these big news cable channels, but if you look at their ratings, they're almost non-existent. I mean, they're so small. So, the, you know, bottom line is, if you can't do news without interrogating power and holding power accountable, it stops becoming news at that point. And sadly, you're seeing that there's tons of layoffs, outlets closing shops. So uh, I, I think also what's happened in news is what's happened to uh, uh, tons of other institutions in our world, uh, universities, uh, hospitals, uh, it's happening to some degree here in Hollywood with uh, studios and streamers, which is just quite simply that it, you know, it, everything gets financialized, everything gets strapped 
to the quarterly uh, stock returns uh, and the, the profit reports. And when that becomes the, these all these institutions were created to serve in some way to, to help, to be useful. And when their entire goal becomes just uh, quarterly, you know, profit reports, uh, they, they really start to fall apart and they become something entirely different. So how to fix it? <laughs> well, I more and more, the longer, well, I, I started very involved with trying to uh, help in my small way with the uh, gun violence uh insanity here in the states and then uh, the realization hit me that the real problem was that billions and billions of now legally uh legal cor corrupt money that had choked our government so i started doing a lot of work in that world and uh and then i got in the climate and all of it sort of came together. And the only real answer I see to it, and once again, it probably doesn't fit a lot of people's sense of identity, <laughs> career art, community, but we need uh, some sort of healthy, constructive, left-wing, uh, you know, hopefully velvet revolution because the neoliberal forces that have taken over. I mean, you saw what Macron did with refusing to hand over the government to the properly elected uh, left-wing party and instead conspiring with uh, Le Pen and the extreme right-wingers. Uh, so I, I really feel like all the change that's going to lead to real action on climate, uh, restoring institutions like our news, um, education, healthcare, all the only road to it is a, a proper left wing, uh, democratic socialist, whatever label you want to put on it. We all know the actions that happen in that direction, but without it, I really don't see any road to change. I mean, if you look at where the United States is with choosing between uh, a lunatic who's held by big money and Donald Trump and a, a total shameless uh, corporatist in Kamala Harris, who's utterly beholden to her donors, this is where you end up when you try and work, you know, quote, within this system and when you try and uh, institute incremental change, it, it's far too powerful and uh, all encompassing. So yeah, my answer would just be the answers that have worked in the past, uh, unions, proper tax structure to prevent extreme congealed wealth from pooling in our societies, uh, access to resources for, you know, ideally all people, but certainly the vast majority of people and uh, a government that's not, uh, you know, doesn't have the hand of uh, giant corporations around its throat so it can give proper pushback and find that middle ground between industry and the general welfare of the people, which seems like a faraway dream at this point. <laughs> so you, it's interesting you raise the topic of what's going on in France and, you know, other kind of what I sometimes described as modern democracies. But do you feel that the with the Trump-Harris election kind of imminent, um, do you think the US political system in itself can help deliver what's required for tackling climate change because if you look at trump versus harris obviously there's it's stark when it comes to action on climate change but even if harris wins as you kind of alluded to it's going to be nowhere near what the scientists are sort of screaming basically what needs to happen 
to to see off the worst effects of climate change. But do you think there's something unique? You've I think you've touched on this issue of effectively corporate lobbying, etc. Do you feel that the US political system is uniquely problematic in terms of tackling climate change amid, you know, a range of democracies around the world and, and kind of not so demo democratic places as well? Yes, uh, it, there's a whole giant story about how the United States uh, turned and, and, and people call it a lot of different things. The best I've heard is the counter revolution to the New Deal um, from old money and corporate money. Uh, but I, I did a bunch of research on a script about all the money in our system. And I was able to interview some state and federal lobbyists off the record. And the main thing I can say is there came a moment after a few hours of discussion where I said, oh my God, it's 10,000 times worse than I thought. And the, the federal lobbyist laughed and he said, well, yeah, but it's 10,000 times better from where I sit. And we couldn't find an exact number, but it's somewhere in the range of $15 billion on any, in any given year are flowing through state and federal government. And, uh, and it's through both parties. Uh, in fact, Democrats take almost twice as much dark money as the Republicans, mostly because Democrats sort of somewhat pretend uh, to be not as corrupt as Republicans. Um, so it, it's a major problem. There's an excellent podcast series out right now, which I, I can't possibly recommend to enough people. And it's uh, from the news outlet, independent news outlet, The Lever. And it's called uh, The Master Plan. And they tell the kind of incredible story of how this plan was put together in the 70s uh, to strike back against um, unions and consumer advocates like Ralph Nader and to institute more control from big business in Washington, D.C. It is, it's all sourced. It's none of it's conspiracy theory, but yeah, the United States is in serious trouble. And, and the worst part is most people through no fault of their own have no idea. And uh, so, no, I, I think the United States is in a uniquely terrible position when it comes to the world's nations to contend with uh, the climate emergency. You, another theme in your work, obviously we've been discussing it already, that, that is kind of inequality and injustice, you know, where people, ordinary people are crushed by the system and the powerful, you know, where the rules are rigged and stacked against them. Is this what drew you or draws you to the topic of climate change, you know, in contrast to say, I don't know, the kind of the nerdy science or, you know, whatever, it's this kind of sense of huge injustice of the world's most vulnerable being being the most exposed to the problem that, that they are least responsible for causing this kind of epic imbalance. Is this is this kind of at the heart of your interest in climate change? I, I think in some ways that is what that's what drew me to climate. It it really, I mean, obviously we all saw Al Gore's inconvenient truth. So that was kind of wake up moment number one. And then I, I sort of assumed that we were in some way dealing with it for, you know, a handful of years. And then when I started really looking into things, I mean, I, I was doing it before I made the big short, but really deep diving a bunch of topics because of the work I was doing in the uh, gun violence uh, world. Uh, you you start to kind of lift up stones, and it's 
really shocking what you find and it, it really shatters a lot of stories we tell ourselves to get through the day and get through the week and by far the biggest <laughs> stone <laughs> that I overturned was very almost accidentally while writing the script for the Dick Cheney movie Vice I was astounded to find that he was a major a player in killing climate action. Like he individually played a giant role. Uh, w. Bush was actually going to do some constructive things about climate. And believe me, I'm no fan of W. Bush's. And there were a bunch of moves that Cheney, Cheney did to make sure that not only did it not happen, but it would go the other direction. So off of that, I started wondering, like, well, where are we at? I remember the Al Gore movie. We've certainly, you know, done things like contribute money and ask candidates what they're doing. But uh, and then when I started asking the questions around the science, talking to scientists, reading, you know, I'm, I'm a deep dive kind of person. So I started reading a bunch of books. I went from alarm to fully losing sleep. And I kept double checking, going back, finding new scientists, experts to talk to, expecting there to be a moment where I could calm down a little bit. And to this day, I've yet to find it. Um. Obviously, your you know your background back background back right back to I guess the the late nineties, early two thousands, the kind of um, the Saturday night kind of era, and kind of I'm interested in your view on whether how or not whether, but how can comedians take on climate change? Is there laughter to be found within climate change, or you know, as with a movie like Don't Look Up, is it is satire the way to 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 approach this? I mean, I'm. You must have thought there's a lot, you know, the way that the comedy's role in this and whether we can laugh at, with, or about climate change. Yeah, they've done a, a, a pretty extensive studies about how people survive extreme events. And the events in the studies, in the uh, excerpts I read, were like being lost at sea, being lost in the woods, being trapped under rubble. And there were really three key conditions that allowed for people to survive, not a hundred percent, but made it much more likely. And one of the big ones is laughter, because in order to laugh, you have to have some distance and perspective. You just can't laugh because if you don't, because if you see someone on roller skates lose control and fall into a lake and you have no distance or perspective, you immediately think, I hope that person doesn't drown. You go jump in the lake, which by the way, is not a crazy response. <laughs> But if, you know, I'm really talking more about a movie or a silly moment, uh, but if you're able to look at it as a, a metaphor for the human condition, where we design these roller skates, but we're still human beings, we can't, you know, uh, fully harness it, and we end up looking ridiculous falling into a lake, you can laugh. And uh, so I think laughter is absolutely key. Um, and so I challenged myself. Uh, we've been doing these shows through Yellow Dot and uh, with stand up comics, and the idea being let's find a way to laugh around these subjects. And I kind of challenged myself to go do, you know, five to eight minutes of stand up and to see what it would feel like. And uh, I definitely cheated in that I had some beers beforehand. 
<laughs> um, I, I did stand up a little bit when I was in college. I, I was never great. I was okay. And it was really interesting. You can definitely get laughs. You can definitely have laughter around these subjects. And in a way, it kind of made me more angry because I was like, I met best like a D plus stand up. I haven't done it in, you know, my God, 40 years. And, uh, you know, there are these stand ups that are highly skilled, charming, confident. And uh, so I was doing it and got some respectable laughs. And it, it infuriated me because it's like, if I can do this, there are comics who can really do it. And uh, why aren't they? Um, but it kind of goes back to the thing, like a lot of people just don't know. They aren't exposed to the real science and the reality of where we're at. But uh, yeah, I, I can't say it enough. It's the reason, you know, we, we knew when we were making Don't Look up if we made it a broad comedy we were gonna get you know lambasted by the critics the kind of the inside my friend likes to call them the savvy crowd would hate the movie and my editor kind of really didn't want to go that road we had a cut that was a little bit more sort of critic friendly and I just said, I go, look, it's not going to, we're, we're releasing it on a worldwide platform. Um, we need people to experience big laughter. And uh, so we did it. And I, I almost predicted they, they have some silly site that does the percentage of good reviews and bad reviews. And I almost predicted it exactly. I was two points off. My my editor was mortified when I told him what I thought we would get. And he was like, no, this is really good. And I'm like, you watch. That professional class does not like to laugh. They consider it low. They consider it. And, and uh, sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And then the response from the world was incredible. Um, and so... Yeah, we're unfortunately in this moment where uh, the choice between populism and uh, uh, the elite professional classes uh, have never been more, uh, there's never been more distance between them. And I really think the key is laughter. I think it's the greatest uh, lie detector test. It's the greatest... Uh, you can't fake it. You just can't. <laughs> um, you've mentioned Yellow Dot Studios, and it, I think it's been more than a year now since since the launch. I think you've said the aim is to try and kind of push back against the flood of disinformation about climate, you know, with memes and short form videos, et cetera, particularly for social. Um, and I, I personally, I often see your weekly extreme weather reports um, kind of popping up in my feed um you know in terms of what yellow dot is working on what's working well in your view and what kind of what have you got coming up next so yeah the the, the impetus behind yellow dot was really simple and it relates back to what we were talking about earlier about the connection between culture economy history uh community and uh, it, and and really, it relates to uh, big party laughs. By the way, let me be clear when I say populism, I mean constructive populism, labor unions, civil rights. Um, there's a tendency here in the United States to assume when you say populism, you mean fascism, <laughs> which I am no fan of. But I think without constructive populism, you get destructive populism, a, a, you know, aka fascism. Anyway, so the impetus behind Yellow Dot uh, really started with, uh, we started to notice that there was this way of speaking and processing information 
uh, in the circles of uh, the professional class or you know, whatever you want to call them, the establishment types, Democrats, liberals, whatever you want to say, and that tended to uh, strip the emotion out of the information and tended to skew towards uh, weaker conclusions, more conservative conclusions that tended to minimize risk and stakes. And we were seeing it even with people we really like and we are sure are well intentioned. So uh, as ridiculous as it seems, one of the big drives for it is like, if we're gonna defeat the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, big oil, the banks that fund them, the travel industry, automotive industry, you know, basically the fossil fuel economy, the billions of uh, dollars and uh, euros that uh, that these industries put into misinformation, emotionally manipulative uh, pieces. We were going to have to speak in a real way. We couldn't try to use the same professional speak they were already using with far greater resources. So the example I gave to our small team was just curse. You, <laughs> the second you curse, it's the one thing those giant industries can't do. I mean, they can maybe pay some influencers to do it, but the second we start using real language and, you know, cursing is much less of a big deal over where you're at in the UK, but here there's still a real puritanical streak in the States. So the idea was to use real language, reintroduce emotion into the discussion because any movement is emotions gonna have to be a part of it, despite what uh, the kind of uh, establishment uh, liberal class uh, likes to think, it is going to be a major part of uh, transforming our, our world. And so it really started with those things, which all came back to uh, the simple idea of laughter, of that you can be angry, sad, uh, you know, anxious, uh, it, it, so long as you can laugh, it means you're processing it. So the first video we made was this parody of uh, the Chevron uh, uh, commercial. And it just hit in a way that really surprised me. We just put it out. We had no marketing behind it. We had no buildup. And it, it just got millions and millions of views. And, uh, and I, we, Stacy, uh, Robert Seal, who runs Yellow Dot Day to Day, her and I were just like, hey, this is kind of interesting. And that's mostly what we've continued to do. Um, and we work a lot with the activists. Um, we, we try and work with any celebrities who seem to get what's going on. Rain Wilson and Yellow Dot, uh, collaborated on a great Game of Thrones parody about climate. And, uh, and you know, from my experience with doing Funny or Die, we all kind of know every piece isn't going to be a, you know, giant hit. Uh, each one's going to hit in kind of the way it needs to, and some will be misses, but the internet is actually perfect for that. It's pretty forgiving. If something misses, it goes away. If it sticks, it stays. So overall, I've been very happy with how it's gone. Our team, you know, we are small, we are underfunded. Uh, of people with big money are not thrilled to... <laughs> give money to us because we are speaking in much more urgent tones we can be silly we can be angry uh, and it's just a language uh that we're trying to use that that 
can lead to change or be a part of a larger change. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, inconvenient truth. Obviously, you saw that along with you know millions of others when that came out. God, what is that now? Fifteen years ago, whatever. Um, maybe a bit more. Um, is was that? I think you alluded to the fact that might have been one of your personal epiphany kind of moments or kind of, you know, penny drop moments for climate change. Were there any others? Can you remember back kind of was there a particular crystallization? Was it a movie, a documentary, a book, a conversation, you know, that got really got you kind of motivated and sort of turned you on to this topic? Yeah, I would say inconvenient truth pushed me into a place that I would say most members of the professional class or establishment liberals are at now, which is that I understood it. I was concerned. It went on my radar. Uh, my, you know, our family started to put it on the list of donations that you do at the end of the year. Uh, but at that time, I was far more horrified and emotional about gun violence, which I still am to this day. Uh, so really, my epiphany was when I looked into where we were at with climate after the research we had done in the interviews we had done for the Cheney movie. And we discovered that he, he really put a knife in the back of action on climate. And I'm trying to remember because it was really like 12 or 14 pieces of information. But what really brought it all home was uh, later when I read uh, Uninhabitable Earth, and then was able to talk to David Wallace Wells, who then introduced me to other scientists. And it was when I landed on the idea of uh, risk, probability, and stakes, that really looking at those elements in uh, the effects of how rapidly we're warming the planet, that it, it put gray hairs on my head because I realized mainstream discourse around climate was willfully ignoring risk and stakes. And I don't say risk and stakes in a sort of casual way. I mean, the mathematics of risk and stakes were not flowing through uh, the way we talk about climate, the way the news uh, media, big news media was covering climate. And uh, when I really started digging into that, it scared the crap out of me. Um, I, about a decade ago, I think it was, I, I interviewed the, the late James Lovelock, the scientist behind the Gaia theory. Um, I was working at The Guardian at the time, and he 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 told me something that kind of made a big headline that kind of made a bit of a ripple at the time, but he told me that humans in his view had not evolved enough yet to deal with something as huge as climate change. In effect, th this problem had come too soon for us as a species. Um, and I guess what he was sort of implying was that we're not clever enough at the moment to deal with it. But I, I think the kind of reaction that comment got, I think kind of, I think he was actually getting at something a bit more nuanced, you know, namely that we're that we're not collective enough as a species in a way, you know, in the way that like a hive of bees might work together when under attack from a you know a predator or something. But humans are too sort of individualistic to solve a global commons challenge like climate change. Do you it's kind of a club, it's quite a depressing and pessimistic view on this, but do you share that view or are you much more of an optimist? Do you have a positivity that we can, in effect, dig our way out of this hole as a species. Yeah, I, I remember that story and it, how incredible that you got to interview him. Um, boy, that is a big question. I mean, there have been times 
periods, eras in human history where I think we could do this. I mean, post-World War II, obviously, the largest collective action of the industrial age, uh, because of that collective positive action fighting back, you know, the Nazis and uh, uh, imperial militarized uh, Japanese uh, nation, uh, we were really in a pretty decent spot with the unions, the you know, beginning to nationalize healthcare, uh, the fairly equitable tax structure. I'm not saying things were perfect. There are plenty of problems, but the trend lines were all going up towards uh, good things and sort of all hit in the early 70s where you look in the states, poverty was all time low. A uh, gap between uh, CEOs, workers, minuscule compared to where it is now. Um, I think if the problem, if we had had full awareness during that <clears throat> period, we would have dealt with it. And and reading about how close that W. Bush administration came to taking action. Um, I mean, we we interviewed uh, Christy Todd Whitman, who was head of the Bush EPA. And to this day, she's still really angry about how uh, Cheney sabotaged the effort, betrayed the president he was vice president for and and really uh, forced her to resign. Um, I, we've come closer than I think uh, that that theory says but since then we've gotten very far away i mean you look at what obama trump and biden did with turning the united states into the number one export of oil i mean i i'm not sure trump is not the brightest guy and i i don't think biden was very high functioning but obama certainly you would think would be smart enough to realize what's going on with climate and why would he do that? And why would he brag about it? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a little tough right now, but I always go back to the good news is we have loads of resources, science, brilliant minds, uh, planners, engineers, all we need to do is start. Um, I think our biggest threat is just, we've never had, a mass media that is this, you know, all pervasive, scientifically calibrated and effective in manipulating people, skewing points of view, spreading misinformation, creating, you know, emotional impressions that are disconnected from the reality. Um, uh, that's that's probably the biggest opponent beyond even just military might or police arresting activists, which is ghastly. Don't get me wrong, but um, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to have the moment. I, I It's very possible we go through, you know, all these stages of rapid violent climate change and everyone just takes them the uh, the majority of people take them as isolated weather catastrophes I, could that happen it could for the first time i'm considering that possibility from what i'm seeing i do tend to think there's going to be a moment and mostly it's because this political system we have the neoliberal age it, is falling apart it's not going to work. It never works. You can't have this degree of income inequality, uh, corruption, destruction. You can't exploit the people to this degree that we're now seeing without some kind of collapse coming. And I think that's the key when that moment happens uh, where we, there can be a change, of course. I lean slightly, ever so slightly, to the optimistic uh, column.
do you in terms of the optimistic column what are you what are you seeing out there at the moment you know is it technology social change is there are there people who are really inspiring you you know are there what are those stories out there that we should be holding on to or amplifying that are the sort of the the roots out of all this well we haven't even really made a sincere worldwide properly funded attempt at innovation on a grand scale there's innovation in the private sector there's small examples of things but when you start putting like 500 billion dollars into scaling up already existing technologies like there's a company here based out of the los angeles called uh uh, e uh equatic and they are successfully pulling CO2 out of seawater. They're not doing it at the scale that's necessary because they're still getting funding. But if you unleashed governments on this kind of thing, uh, you know, the closest example would be like the Manhattan Project, how fast that all came together, even though its endpoint was grisly destruction. Uh, we can do a lot with that, but even simple things like no one in our government has ever said like, hey, you know what? Let's paint all the roofs white in the Southwest to reflect some of the heat back. Um, hey, you know what? Let's create a, rather than just tax breaks and rebates for solar panels, let's actually create a program to cover all federal buildings and state and municipal buildings in solar panels to help protect our grids. I've never once heard the mayor of Los Angeles say, hey, I know the economy is hard, a bunch of you can't afford it, but if you are some of the few lucky people that can put solar panels on your house, it will help the power grid, you know, we just had power outages yesterday here in Los Angeles. It's just absurd that in 2024, that's still happening. Uh, we've had nothing but fair warning. So there's all kinds of big and small things we can do. Like the U.S. military is, you know, it's basically a slush fund for, you know, funneling billions of dollars to these big defense companies. But there's a lot of money and resources there. If the mission of these large militaries around the world became climate mitigation, I, it's just we can't even fathom uh, what could happen as far as building canals to, you know, channel water from an area that's getting hit, you know, with a deluge of rain to an area that's getting hit with flash flooding. I'm, I'm not saying this stuff's going to happen in like a year, but we should have been on this 10 years ago. There's just so many things that are just fairly easy to, to do. Here's a real simple one. Like why are oil companies still allowed to advertise? There's no, uh, or on, television or broadcast or streaming there's no ads for cigarettes on television and that that's something you could do in like one day um how is the united states not declared a climate emergency there's a list of 60 70 just easy things we could do but you're seeing it with these corrupted governments they won't even give a climate speech that's how beholden to the oil donors and the banks they are. So sorry if my answers go on very long, but it, I've learned through the years, it's impossible to talk about climate. It's so big in kind of short answers. You talked about some of the solutions there, but there's also a kind of narrative you hear from the sort of the tech bros, the kind of Elon Musk's and the, you know, let's just techno fix our way out of this. Um, 
you know, let's head to Mars, let's, you know, drive EVs, let's, you know, do this and that. This kind of um kind of sort of macho approach to climate change, almost sometimes almost militaristic. Do you think there's dangers in that? And do you think that's sort of superficially appealing to many people? I've heard that even from, you know, like Elon Musk is a fraud. He's an idiot. So when you hear someone like him say it, he has no idea what he's talking about. I've heard him talk about climate. He demonstrates no understanding, no comprehension of the Earth systems data. Like he's like, you know, not a uh, intelligent individual, but I have heard people I respect kind of throw that out there, this sort of vague idea that we're going to innovate our way out of it. And I always say the same thing, like, well, when's that going to (laughs) happen? It's not happening now. And have you seen, like, What's going on with the East Antarctic ice shelf? Have you seen what's going on with the Amazon, with the AMOC, with the Greenland uh, ice sheath? Like, how much time do you think we have? And really what happens when I have those discussions is you quickly discover the person has this kind of vague oil company marketed kind of net zero by 2050 kind of time frame in their head and they in all actuality think it's still a problem for our grandchildren and they don't understand once again uh the probability slash risk and stakes um i mean just you know in terms of wrapping it up we're you know we're a couple of months away i guess from the u.s election and the, not just the u.s but the whole world goes through this kind of psychodrama every four years and it feels like a sort of permanently rolling campaigning country or political system it feels and if we if we look to like say this time next year um in terms of the you know i guess the two outcomes of that possible the po- two possible outcomes of election as well as all of the down ticket, you know, all of the what will happen to the Senate, the Congress, et cetera. What, where do you think we're going to be in a year's time, particularly in relation to action on climate in, in terms of the U.S. political response? But it's a very tricky topic here in the United States. It goes back to what we began this conversation with, which is, you know, it's the narratives we tell ourselves to live in uh, this economy, this society, the ways we make ourselves feel good, the incentives, the rewards. The real truth is, if you look at the policies enacted by each administration, really going back to Reagan, and you put them on paper, and you don't tell someone which president did which thing, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. Um, I've done it before as an exercise. The one that's really shocking is Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, where you look at the two of them and it's like, Bill Clinton, what he did is actually, I mean, Reagan was horrible, but Bill Clinton, maybe even more destructive And you look at the W. Bush years, then you go into Obama, then you go into Trump. It's really surprising with Trump, who do not get me wrong. I can't stand him. He's a malignant force. He's an idiot, a lunatic. But if you really look at what he did, and then you look on paper at what W. Bush Cheney did, W. Bush Cheney are far worse. It's harder to calculate the damage Obama did because his his damage was, yes, it was material. He enacted the horrendous policies that led to hundreds of thousands of deaths, but his was like a betrayal. Anyway, long story short, I don't think you'll really see a material difference um, as far as climate action, I don't really know if the United States can get much worse than we already are. And I think Trump is such a clod 
the, the work that would be necessary to make it worse. I just don't know if he's capable of that because his ego is so big. He likes to be in control. Kamala Harris will be complete inaction and probably expanding uh, oil drilling leases. Um, I don't know. I don't want Trump to win. Trump's just upsetting. Uh, but, you know, everyone talked about how he said to the oil companies, give me a billion dollars, I'll give you whatever you want. And my response was, you don't think the Democrats are <laughs> taking a billion dollars in oil money? They definitely are, either directly or related money. So I think until these two parties, people really get bold and start ignoring these two parties, the change won't really be substantive. But my message to the world on climate is do not wait for the United States. Uh, China is far more of a climate leader than the US. And I'm not giving a free pass to China as far as their government, things they've done. I'm not saying they're perfect, but on climate, they're way ahead of us. I even think you guys in the UK are a couple of steps ahead of us. Um, yeah, the US, until we fix this elaborate legalized corruption system, I just don't have a lot of high hopes for the US in any regard. Okay, well, th thanks so much, Adam, for your time. <laughs> that, that, that's quite a big, that's quite a conversation we've just had there. <laughs> uh, well, I love it. And they, that is by far the most pessimistic topic and the grimmest sort of projection I have is the state of the, the U.S. politics and uh, elections. But uh, I didn't mean to end on that dour note. Fortunately, it's a big, big world. Well, we, you know, so appreciate your time. Thank you so much.